Hello and welcome back to the God's Business Show. I want to give a shout out to you as a listener for adding to this amazing launch. We've had over 300 five-star reviews, 300 now on the God's Business Podcast. We're on every single podcast platform, every place the podcasts are played. On the YouTube channel, we've had like over 179 hours watched just this last month. So just epic. Just think about 179 hours. That's a lot of uh, hours. That's if you watch for a complete week straight combined between everyone else. Uh, We've had over 100K views on social media platforms of this kind of content getting out. If you're new here, I interview the top Christian entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and influencers on how you can create not just a good business, but God's business. I want to say thank you to everyone that's been a part of that, sharing the content, connecting there. If you're not subscribed on YouTube yet, you're going to want to do that. If you have not yet gone to a podcast platform and left a review yet, this has been impactful to you. Subscribe, rate, and review there. We do giveaways and fun things to say thank you to you guys. The biggest thing, again, is sharing content that's actually great for entrepreneurs as well as Christians that are called to business. This is the place that we're looking to serve and where we're bringing in the best people and highlighting them to equip you in those areas. And I really believe that we did that here today. Someone that I've seen lead the coaching industry for a very long time, yet I saw him in a place of a very new age, let's try everything, witchcraft kind of deal, hyper spiritual community, yet without Jesus, which has been seen throughout the Bible forever, yet we've seen that Jesus is that core power, right? The most powerful spirit is the Holy Spirit, the most powerful name above every name, is Jesus's name. And he encountered Jesus in a very powerful way that has strictly impacted his life and his business. And he tells the entire story of how he went from new age all the way to Jesus loving Christian entrepreneur and is now impacting the world with that message and mission. Please welcome my friend, Joel Brown. Mr. Joel Brown, welcome to the show, man. Excited to have you here, brother. Thanks for having me. It's been a little while, man. Yeah, we've yeah. been through we've been through the journeys together. I came out of ministry school, went into business, saw you with Addicted to Success, and all the growth there. Yep. You were doing your thing, building business. And I think this is an interesting part of the conversation is you've built business with and without Jesus in different ways, and and even when you get to know Jesus, you have a transformation. But sometimes it takes a little bit to explore. What is your inheritance as a Christian? What what does freedom really look like? And what has Jesus died and bought and paid for? And so I'm sure you've even had new revelations over the last couple of years, man. So man. Let, give me give me an update first. Like we just started chatting prior to even hitting record. Got a yeah. baby on the way, married in LA. Give me what's been the core focus for you personally, faith, life, business ventures. What's, yeah. What have you been up to? Yeah, it's such a great question. Um, <clears throat> wow, where do I start? You obviously know me from Addicted to Success, right? It's number one Our personal research, development yeah. website online. Uh, you know, we've reached over 356 million website views. And, you know, that was great. You know, it's put me on a lot of stages and in documentary films with some of the biggest in the industry of personal development. And I, I got to a point, this is like about eight years ago. So I've been doing this for like 14 years, you know, in the personal development space. Eight years ago, I just started feeling really empty, man. You know, and that was when I came across Christ. Uh, and what's really interesting is, you know, I was brought up in religion. I was brought up Seventh-day Adventist. So we would keep the Sabbath, you know, Friday sundowns to Saturday sundown yeah. uh, would be, you know, no TV, no, you know, going out to the shops or anything. It was just like spend that day observing God. And um, it felt restrictive, pretty strict. Um, but what's really interesting is just coming to Christ and, and then like going through with the experiences I do now. I actually look forward to this happening. <laughs> I look forward to just like resting in him so I can see why God gave it to us as a gift, right? Uh, real, and so, real, quick, real quick on this, bro. Like I think what you said is so profound because – at first, it can feel restrictive, but it says that if they, if you love me, you'll obey my commands, and it becomes this desire. Like once you get to know God, you want yeah. to, like the desire goes up. I've even had times, bro, where people are like, "Oh, I read Bible in the year," and I, I thought, "Yeah, whatever, bro." Like I've been doing this a long time, type thing. And now mm. I remember starting the year, I'm like, I'm like pulling out my Bible, Bible in the year plan, like all these simple things that seemed restrictive or elementary man when you draw near to him you start like 
desiring things like the Sabbath and how he created things and yeah. the small things, the elementary things become profound. And I just think that that's a really big deal. And also I think a sign of that, like that maturity, but also that child likeness of, yeah, this must be important. If God talks about it, if he had, if he yeah. actually spoke about it, it must be important. So please keep going. But I just think that was super important, man. Yeah. You know, I, I recently said that religion demands obedience to earn love while the gospel offers love to inspire obedience. And that's the difference, okay. right? When you talk about being inspired to want to be obedient to God, because you know that his ways are the ultimate, you know, <laughs> like when yeah, yeah. people look at like Tony Robbins and they look at you know Jack Canfield or these people, it's like, they're just human like us, you know, like, yeah, they're great at what they do. They're skilled in their craft. They have a network. They have a track record, but did they walk like Jesus? No. Of course not. <laughs> no one can walk this earth. Try walking this earth for even, you know, one week without violating your purpose, um, which, which is sin. Sin is a violation of purpose. You know, it's, it's violating the original design that God created us in and coming out of design, uh, which is where we start to malfunction, you know, so someone might sin and go, Oh yeah, nothing bad really happened. But if you continue to go down that path, then you, you just end up going down a path of destruction which leaves you in damnation, right? And it's not because God's doing it to us. It's because we're choosing it ourselves, right? Mm. So, yeah, man, I, I definitely um, felt that I didn't quite understand religion. Uh, and, and, and to be honest, like my mom always told me, you know, Jesus loves you. And that was a beautiful picture that she painted for me. And she um, at least helped me to relate to Christ as somebody that, you know, you can come to. But I just didn't like the dogma around the institution of religion. So I pulled away. Yep. I went into all the metaphysical, the new age stuff, similar to you, man, not as deep as you with like some of the dark arts, you know, I was around the crystals and the tarot cards and the psychics and, and all that, but it didn't get into any sort of like deep witchcraft wizardry or anything like that. Well, but what uh, was like some of the craziest things that you would say that you got into? Cause this is very popular right now, right? We talked about yeah. people are searching, so it's good. They're searching. They're like you know, whatever they want to do, bro. They're doing the di yeah. dark deprivation, which actually probably could be a pretty cool Christian experience, like where you're in pitch black for like a week and you, you can't see any light, whatever. Wow. <laughs> you know, yeah. People do, people are doing whatever they can to search, but like, what was some of the things that you were into at the time? Cause some of the other people listening, man, maybe they have gone through a search through the same yeah. things and it may be super helpful for them. Yeah, you know, I did transcendental meditation with one of the top teachers in, in California who used to work with the Beatles and Maharashi, um, uh, you know, I, and, and the thing is, like, for me, I I never felt like I 100% um, bought into the fluffiness of it. Like, I, I tried it and it's searching for, like, is there anything in here that could be kind of cool? as a transformational modality that I can use in my coaching. It was always about like, how can I deepen my craft for coaching? So it wasn't necessarily yep. like I felt like I needed to do it because I was looking for, for anything within myself um, to some degree, maybe, but nothing really consciously consciously. It was like, I want to learn this thing so I can kind of be the cut above the rest of everybody else. That's just doing, you know, normal yep. coaching. Um, that was where my intention was, but uh, yeah, man, I, I was around, you know, transcendental meditation, did that for two years. It was just like constantly repeating a mantra, which meant nothing to me, to be honest. And I asked, well, what does it mean? They go, it's not meant to mean anything. It's, so I'm like in this every day in this kind of like just repeating this nothingness and and told to surrender and come back up and down and all this stuff. And, and, and like, you know, yeah, I mean, it was good to sit with my eyes closed and quiet, but it didn't draw me towards any sort of wisdom beyond that. You know what I mean? I'm not like yeah. it does now when I read the scriptures and I meditate on that or I visualize my connection with God and go into co-creation around my vision with God. It's much more powerful, obviously. But I um, had an encounter with a guy called Donnie. And Donnie uh, Epstein, he does this uh, network chiropractic. Um, he's He's been in the circles of working with a lot of personal development guys lately. And, um, you know, nice guy for, for like face value and all that. But... Uh, you know, I don't agree with the practices that I witnessed. You know, for me, I was, um, I, I got asked to come in with a group full of other coaches, authors, speakers, and um, he did this thing where he had this, it was weird, bro. It was like this little wand. It looked like a Harry Potter type wand. And he's talking about 
you know, the levels of consciousness, um, which I understand. Okay. There's levels to it. Great. But he's talking about how we can tap into different metaphysical fields and you can adjust your energies and remove the blocks in your energy centers and you realign the chakras. And so I'm watching this happening and a guy's laying on a table and he, he, he does this thing with the one, this guy's like this and he kind of starts like convulsing and his body's like involuntary moving like a snake. And he's huffing and puffing and huffing and puffing. And, and, and then he goes, you know, this Donny guy's like, da -da, like this, and he stops. And then the next person gets up and they're screaming on the table while they're under his sort of spell. And I'm sitting here going like, I had somebody like a week before that's brought up Jesus to me. I hadn't thought about it for the longest time. And she's like, can I pray for you? Now I'm starting to actually notice the darkness around me in this space. Wow. And, um, getting invited to go to like shaman temples and tents and to call in like spirits and all this stuff. And I'm like starting to feel convicted to say no. And I get asked to get on this table. And so this, this guy leans in, he says to me, Oh, when you were younger, you used to do capoeira. I used to do Brazilian martial arts. I was like, yeah, I used to do capoeira. I'm like, how do you know? He goes, we just know. And I go, who's we? So he's obviously speaking to spirit, right? Or spirit or spirits. Yeah. And I was like, okay, this is fishy. So I'm laying on the table for the longest time and I hadn't prayed like properly. And I'm praying, God, if I'm not supposed to be here, please protect me. This doesn't feel right, you know? And so anyway, he's doing all these things on my back and I'm laying there and nothing would happen. But, you know, if I go to the gym, I don't usually sweat that much. Like I sweat a little bit, but I don't like, I'm not a profuse sweater. I was sweating yeah. with like sweat bees dripping off my face. Like my shirt was soaked in sweat. The table was covered in my sweat and I got up and he's like, this is so weird. Nothing like, I don't understand what's happening. I get out of the room. A guy had messaged me a week before that said, Jesus loves you. And I was like, I thought this guy was a Jesus freak. Anyway, I message him and I'm like, bro, uh, can I have a chat? So he's like, yeah, cool. So, you know, we jump on a phone call and I told him the experience. He said, man, that is the Kundalini spirit. And he said, the Holy spirit is in you blocking wow. and stopping anything from entering in you. He said it was burning up, protecting you, bro. I was like, wow. You know, and my partner at the time had, had done it and she was having like nightmares and everything for weeks after this experience, you know, so I'm starting to put all the pieces together and going, wait a minute, there is good. There is evil. This is dark. This doesn't feel right. It's almost like God gave me that discernment because of this prayer that I was open to beforehand to have Jesus in my life. Cause I felt empty. I had all the material things and the big successes. And I was like, I feel like something's missing. So I started out on this path, man, where I started to like, actually, you know, talk more with people. I went to, I was like that real pain in the ass person that was going to ministers and pastors and like just drilling them as hard as I can with their theology and trying to call out blind spots and, I just really wanted to know, man, you know, and I kept, I was told by my friend, just keep praying for truth. So I just prayed every day, like God reveal truth to me. Um, you know, I don't want religion. I will just want the truth. That's all I've ever really cared about, even with personal development and everything else. And, and he just continued to reveal it to me, man. Like I had never had that many believers show up in my life, man. It was like uncanny, like people that were like, Hey, can I pray for you? Or someone has just start like told me about a Bible verse or a Christian person. I really felt like I knew, like I would meet someone and feel like they feel like home. Like I really know them. Yeah. And then I find out they're a believer and then I ask them and then we have a great connection, you know? So God really just started showing me where his fingerprints are in my life and how he operates in everyone else's if they're open to it. So I just started to, yeah, man, just pull away from all the, confusion, the salad bar spirituality where everyone's kind of handpicking the fancy trendy words and the stuff that's fluffy and sounds cool in the new age, which by the way, has no sorts of meshing. It's all, it, it's mixed mash. It actually isn't cohesive. Buddhism is not cohesive with the Akashic records. The Akashic records are not cohesive with, you know, the, the Kabbalah. It's not cohesive with uh, Egyptian mysticism, like you can't pair them all together and say there's a cohesive narrative. The only thing that I've found in my study of all the different belief systems when I studied theology and studied Christian apologetics and, and philosophy was finding that the only thing that holds a consistent narrative is Christianity. I can say that with so much conviction, man, like I pulled it apart so hard with apologists and theologians, atheists, Muslims, you know, like I just, just poked it, you know, and the logical consistency in the gospel, the empirical evidence, when you look back in history, those places actually existed, 
and reveal evidence as well. And then the experiential relevance, which is my experience of the Holy Spirit and seeing miracles unfold before my eyes and healings take place. I can't deny it that. I just can't, man. But if I came to you and just said, Nicholas, you know, I saw prayers answered and miracles unfold before my eyes. You'd be like, that's cool, Joel, but I haven't had that experience, right? I know you have, obviously. Yeah, yeah. But you can't just go with that. There needs to be more. There needs to be logical consistency, empirical evidence. You know, there, yep. there, it needs to be adequate for somebody to say, okay, there's something here. And then you start your exploration, but none of it moves until you turn this heart of stone into a heart of flesh, man. Yeah. Cause there'll always be a reason why God didn't do it. Like there's people that have seen miracles before and walk away from God. They get convinced. Oh, maybe it was just this thing in their head where if you, the placebo effect, it's the universe, even if they've seen man, it's the universe, <laughs> yeah, it's the universe, like the th there's, there's always a place if you want for doubt to come in for anyone. I mean, think about the disciples, right? Like they walked with Jesus, saw him do everything. And then when he died, they didn't even check to see if he actually rose again and told they, what do you, how many times do you think they talked about this exact scenario of I'm going to go, I'm going to die, but on the third day, and they were all like discouraged, moping around. I knew it wasn't true. You know, it's like <laughs> they had literally watched uh, uh, loaves and fish multiplied and like so there's always like this place for that and I, I love that this what you had gone through that holy spirit protection one time when i was doing all my demonic stuff which i need to do an episode on for this show so that people understand it but that's before i ever got saved or encountered god that's where my journey was and it was so interesting because i had invited all these kids catholic christians and and mormons and that that was the majority of my school i was like you guys have no power. All you do is you don't party and you don't drink, at least some of them. That was the <laughs> only power I saw. As I come to my house, we have these demonic things. And so I, I come over, they come over to my house and nothing is moving, like nothing's working. And though this story may sound completely crazy, but again, I have no real benefit of it sounding bad because then people just think it's, a, so there's no benefit to me saying it. Yeah. A, uh, some presence called my mom's landline in the house, landline, home phone. Nobody has it. Answer it. Ask for the, a kid there. This voice actually spoke to him over the phone and said, take off your necklace. He pulls it out. And, and this is how simple it was. This kid obviously wasn't devout in his beliefs because he was literally at my house looking to see spirits. So yeah, he wasn't like follow. He wasn't maybe believed in Jesus, but not a follower, obviously pulls off like a Catholic rosary, just like Jesus on the cross. And we're like, take it off. Cause we were so blind, so blind. We didn't think, wow, what does that mean? We just take it off. So he takes it off. And then all of a sudden the environment was able to, the demonic presences were able to finally do something. But just this kid being there, we were there for two hours and nothing could even work. And I spent eight months in this environment, cultivating the environment that would have been conducive to that. Yeah. And this, yeah. this one kid who just had a minor even thought of Jesus, that whatever that meant, that commitment that he um, had of putting that on, there was some type of presence that just paralyzed the atmosphere. So even with you, that it's not like you were full on, I'm all in. You're just like, uh oh, this doesn't feel good. God, if you're here with me, please do this and just paralyze a dude that's like making people convulse on the table. I think that that's just another example of, just the power of God and also Jesus's name as well, how powerful it really is. Yeah. You know, he has the final say in reality, man, like his, the eternal word abides forever and uh, Satan's time is running out. <laughs> so he already knows he's beating it. He's just, he's doing what he can in desperation at this point. And, you know, you see what's going on in the world too, bro. It's like there's a conveyor belt that's trying to get everyone on this bit towards the beast system. Um, yep. It's definitely in play. Like the infrastructure for the beast system is being built as we speak. It's everything that Daniel spoke about in the scriptures. It's everything that John saw in Revelation that's unfolding. Like we can't deny it, man. Like you can bury your head in the sand, but reality will come very much so knocking on your front door at some point in your lifetime. And so – whether that full completion of revelation it happens in our lifetime or our children's or their children's, we can't say because ultimately God holds the reins. 
But I do think that every generation has a wake up call. They all have an opportunity to choose where they stand. And I think the last three years with this pandemic nonsense that went on definitely woke a lot of people up. And I had more people than ever reach out saying to me that they want to pick up a Bible again or who is Jesus or um, they started asking questions about like revelation, you know, so in all of it, you know, some people don't move until there's fear, you know, some like for me, I was moved by a lack of inspiration in one field and looking for inspiration in another, you know, like Christ is a, is a relational God. He's a living being that wants to relate to us. And so it's not going to come just always from a book. It comes, comes from the way that we you know, interpret life and the way that he can interact with us in real time. So if you're looking for like a one fix thing, it's not like that. It's a culmination of experiences because he is an experiential being just as we are. He's just, he's just got like, <laughs> he's got the love that we haven't even experienced yet ready for us when we step in, man. Like I can't explain the amount of times where I've just had like incredible moments, man, with the, you know, the Holy spirit moments and, yeah, it's it's hard to deny, man. Like we all fluctuate, you know, we're not exactly always like running on that path strong all the time in perfection. We fluctuate, but I do know how it feels when I pull away from God. It does feel empty. Yeah. Yeah, and it feels like sometimes when you go through those phases that it feels almost so far and distant to come back. And then once you just like, you do it enough, you lock in again. You're like, no, nah, I'm going to spend time. I'm going to worship. I'm going to, I'm going to give things. I'm going to read biblically how, what's some of the tools that god's given us to to get us in position and alignment with what he's doing because he's always i mean think about it, he spoke the universe into existence and it's still continually growing from that moment where they're saying it's the universe is literally still just growing from that Expanding. word yeah. and that was interesting what you had said earlier as well I, I do have a question about how people perceived your transformation at the time but you had said something about someone uh about the logical side it has to line up someone had said science is like the logical pursuit of god and one of the things that was interesting is like when people started getting into this like quantum physics and all this this is when they found out that like at the source of everything is all they found is light right and like the beginning is like let yeah. there be light and like they found at the source and it's like all these crazy things even the they there's companies that all they did was try to disprove god so they try to figure out out of mm. all the promises in the Old Testament and the ones that were fulfilled, which ones did get fulfilled for sure, proven, and what's the chance of it? And it was like 9E to the 42nd power for like the first yeah. eight that they proved. And it was like like True. just the chance that Jesus yeah. even rode a donkey in Hosanna, like all at the exact time. And it was like, yeah, okay, that one was like, pretty much no chance ever and then they proved eight is where they got like absolutely proven it was like a number that wouldn't even fit on a calculator you know so i thought yeah. what you had said there was really cool and if you want to say something on it cool but i really want to know how people perceived like when i got saved i was pretty young very zealous very big encounter so i probably came off the wrong way to everyone i came back from like yeah. demon kid yeah. to like yeah. jesus too. freak bro yeah and and probably did a little bit wrong, but like, how did your friend group perceive what the heck was going on, and and what was their kind of thought or feeling about it? Yeah, one of my close friends, uh, he told me many years later. Like, this was actually this happened eight years ago. He told me like two years ago that he said he stayed up one night feeling like, can I still be friends with Joel? Like, and and we had known each other for like four years at that point. And he's just like, I don't know, I don't know, like, if I can do this, because he said he felt so like judged and shamed, even though right. I wasn't necessarily personally judging and shaming him, but I was like sharing stuff on social about like, you know, like you have to carry the weight of your sins and the wages of, you know, the wages of sin is death and things like that. And like warning people, it was coming from a place that was very much intense. Like, yeah, I don't even talk like that now. I talk in a different way, you know, and there's always a way to share the gospel um, that relates to that individual. That's why I, I feel like my ministry is even more effective when I can talk one-on-one -on -one with people or in smaller groups rather than trying to hit the masses with everything all the time. Yeah. Um, but 
Yeah, man. Like, uh, you know, that same friend who was atheist at the time, we, we had so many debates. He's now, he identifies as agnostic, which is funny because I tell him, uh, I go, that's even worse. <laughs> I said, because yeah. at least an atheist has made a decision. You're sitting on the fence, man. <laughs> I'm like, make a decision already. Uh, he laughs about that. But but I, yeah, it's funny. Recently, he's, he's definitely had some people around him come to Christ as well. And I think he's starting to like kind of think about like, what what is with this Jesus thing? You know, he's, he's going to be poking into it at some point. But that's the thing. It can be a timing thing too for some people. They're just not like in that feeling a sense of a dire need to be able to uh, explore something that's existential. And maybe sometimes people need that, you know, that pain in their life. Um, everyone has different pain thresholds, you know, for me, I felt empty, man. I felt apathetic. I got sick of the industry and the space. I was like, is this it? Is this all I can have? Is this, you know, what's, what else is there? And I told my mom, I was kind of, you know, bragging about the achievements. And my mom goes, Joel, I'm not impressed. She goes, I'm proud of you for who you are and your character. And she goes, I'm not impressed because you're not going to take this with you when you die. And I was just like, boom, that just landed so hard for me. Um, and it made me question like, yeah, you know what? She's right. I don't take this with me when I die. So what is next? You know, it's the eternal, man. It's it's what goes beyond this. Like, I wanted a bigger vision. God gave it to me. The bigger vision is eternity. It's not the end game that we're all playing here so often. So the infinite game is the game that is the fun one to be a part of, right? Because it goes beyond what we can even see and imagine. So, you know, I, I like you before you talk about prophecy. I like talking with people that are open to it. Some people want the logical. And I think, you, you know, when it comes to disproving God, I think, science doesn't disprove god god proves science right like all his um uh, his fingerprints are in his design we can see it uh mm -hmm. and one of my friends recently was like you know well how do we know that what god says is true and when you look at the scriptures i said yeah it would be like a random book with a bunch of random things in there if it didn't hold any sort of like prophetic weight wouldn't it because it would just be like any other textbook maybe right. some historical things but i said there's a difference between history anyone can write history because it's happened but not everyone can write prophecy and i said christ is, uh, god has written through man inspired through man in the in the scriptures there's something like over four thousand something prophecies right and we're at a point where the scripture in the scriptures when you look at prophecy 84 percent of them have already been fulfilled already we are in last days, whether you like it or not. People don't like hearing that sometimes because it means you got to, you know, actually open your eyes. But when you look deeper at Revelation, we, my co-host on, on our podcast, it's called The Unknown God, Pastor Marcos Torres. Him and I just did a whole entire series on Revelation. We broke down every single chapter and turned it upside down and gutted it. It was insane. Like I, I learned so much even just in that. We prayed over it, poured our heart on it. It, it was like 16 episodes. It took us like three months to break it down. But essentially... Can, 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 can you say the show again too? Because if you're... Yeah, it's called The Unknown God. Like, God. The Unknown God. You guys on YouTube God. as well? Uh, we do have some videos on YouTube, but the best way to do it is um, we put out a new series. Like we compiled the series. We called it Earth 2.0. The Reconstruction of uh, and Understandings of Revelation, right? But... Um, you can go on Spotify and just look at the unknown God. And fun fact, you know, when um, Paul was speaking to the the Greeks, right, at the time, like the thing about Paul, he's so insane, man. Like he he was so good with his understanding of scripture, a great, great writer, great orator, right? And um, he understood different nature uh, nations and he understood the way to relate to different cultures. So if you have a look in the scriptures and you see the letters to the different churches and, and like the Ephesians and um, Colosseans and the, um, uh, the Hebrews, like the way it's written is written in like lots of different ways of speaking um, so that they can understand. And the way that Paul would communicate to the Greeks is he, he knew that they loved like the mythical and the mystical, right? So he referred to Christ as the unknown God. So, and this made them lean in to want to know about this unknown God. He had such a great way of spreading the gospel. So we were like, you know, what are we trying to do with this podcast? Well, we want to inspire people that are either like deep in religion that don't get it and it doesn't click and they just can feel the resistance and don't like the institution and, or they're in like the new age space and they want to find the truth. So this is a podcast about God for people that don't like church. 
That's the wow. subtitle to the unknown God. And uh, like I said, man, we have so many people that have come from the new age and religion that have recreated a relationship with Christ, which is really cool. Um, but in there, we broke down the prophecies and we're going through it and talking about like last days and like church and state power come back into play and the B system. And I said, you know, a lot of people don't understand that 16% actually happens rapidly in last days, like very rapidly, like it never has before. So even though we're at 84, it's like, oh, maybe we've got another like 500 years until 16. No, that 16% can happen in a seven year span or less. You know, like it's, it's a pretty big deal. So, um, I mean, you look at, uh, Isaiah 53, right. And my Jewish friends that deny Christ. And I'm like, well, can you tell me about Isaiah 53? And they were like, oh, I don't, like, I don't know that. And I said, yeah, it's not, you don't know it because it's forbidden by your rabbis. They don't want you to read it and see Jesus in it because that prophecy was from Isaiah who you are quite happy to read through that book of Isaiah, but you deny the man, the Messiah that's in that as Christ, when that's exactly describing Christ who was going to come thousands of years later. And he did, you know, so it's pretty insane, man. When you look at prophecy, it's the way that God communicates that we can trust him because if we can look at prophecy and go, Oh, that actually did happen. And then you see it continued to build faith through the scriptures and through the times throughout history. History is his story, right? It's God's story that's unfolding. We're a part of it, whether you like it or not, right? Even if this is the interlude to the eternal, we're a part of it. And it's it's just, I don't know, man. This stuff gets me jazzed up, bro, as you can hear. <laughs> you can see. And then we talk about personal development. I'm like, yeah, your beliefs, your habits. Your... This stuff right here is the juice, man, I'm telling you. Yeah, it's it's actually fired me up so much and grown me just unleashing this. I felt like I was kind of, because I was in this world for my work, teaching, training, you know, we invest eight, 10 hours a day, depending on the day, doing it. Now that I've been able to talk about God, acknowledge him in everything that I'm doing, but just kind of like have these conversations, bro. It's just like grown me so much just being able to talk about something that I know is the most important. It's been so cool, yeah. man. So even just thanks for bringing that to the table as well. And that's cool that you guys started that and have multiple angles. Uh, do you yeah. bring in guests or you guys, you, we said had, you had a pastor on there as well. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, the pastor Marcos is uh, jamming with me. We co-host together. Uh, he has more of a understanding of theology. He's been a minister for more than I think 11 or 12 years now. Um, but it's cool because we can balance it out because I came from the new age background and he's come from more of a, you know, church background. So we like bring the two together, but he's also very much about relationship and not religion. He's very yeah. against the whole religious institution. And, and here's the thing I want to define because, you know, we can like really battle it out with religion, but the truth is that, um, I think like, you know, Christ practiced religion. He had his rituals and, and, and his practices, but it's, empty religion that's the problem it's the religion that's used as a vehicle for power and greed and and you know money and control and so on um which isn't obviously of the kingdom of god so yeah i i find like you know when i was in bali in indonesia i was in a place called ubud and uh it's a very like hippy dippy woo woo la la place uh and i say that just because you know like i even say that to people that that do uh, identify as a like, hippy dippy you know hippie uh, we have a laugh about it but like, I'll be sitting there amongst like a bunch of, you know, people there that are, you know, in that space. And I'm sitting there talking to them about Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and this, the conversation usually starts with, you know, talk about I'm um, a Christian or we talk about, you know, like, uh, you know, talk about the way, the way of Christ. And then it's like, oh yeah, Christ consciousness. I'm like, no, not Christ consciousness. Like, no, that's not, that was never even biblical. That's something term that came up recently in new age. It's not even a thing. Um, but I'll say to him, like, you know, like I, that they say like, oh, I don't like religion. And I'll say, yeah, me too. They're like, what? Yeah. I say, yeah, I can't stand it. And they're like, really? It, it, it like drops the walls, man. They open up and go, mm -hmm. oh, he feels like I do better. So then they actually say, well, what has he got here? If he doesn't like that, which I've thought is the whole kit and caboodle, the whole package the whole time, then what is the thing that's in there? And I say, I love the essence and the soul of what Christ. And they're like, yeah, me too. And then I go, yeah. And I say, you know why I love reading the Bible there? Why? It's from the patriarchy. Or it's all, and I'm like, no, 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 no. But 
I love Jesus and I love the standards he set and the way that he walked and what he taught. And I said, and you know why I read the scriptures? I said, why? And I said, because he points to the scriptures as authority. So I trust him and I read it because he says that it's the truth. And they're like, oh, it changes their whole perspective on like why it's important, man. And then I pray for them. So good, dude. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I agree. I even looking at, did you see the Jesus Revolution movie? Not yet, man. Not yet. I do think it's kind of weird. like, I know it's, uh, I've been watching the chosen. So it's kind of weird to like watch him acting as the main character Funny when I've been me, watching yeah, him yeah. as Jesus the whole time. You know what I mean? So that's kind of Kelsey grandma from Frasier who was in there. Apparently has come to Christ. Like he, he was like, he said it's the most profound movie he's ever been a part of. And that guy's wow. been in like a lot of TV shows and movies. But it was just an example again of of relating to a culture and even for you where you your background like your personal background even in the business side that's why I like bu business guys can relate when i first i came from ministry school man 14 countries miracles i get into business and i think i'm in these powerful rooms i think god wants to use me i start talking to people about jesus and they're like bro like who are you like what are you doing here no respect right because it was like yeah, I wasn't, I didn't relate to them. I had never done anything in their space. And so even with Lonnie, who's the main character that would be Jesus and the chosen, but Lonnie Frisbee in this movie is, is the name of the character. Like he related to all those people. And so because of that, just like brought in mass amounts of people and you can relate through so many ways, right? Your, your background, your backstory, what you currently do is your profession. You see a football player or a basketball player, if they're preaching Jesus, like there's kids out there, there's other people that are like, yeah. you know, I don't know about that, but this guy's a baller basketball player. Like I, re I relate to that at least. There's some type of relatability, and that's what you have in business, the type of business you're in, and then also yeah. your back. And that's cool that you can relate that way. And the religion side, man, you're yeah. right. The people that miss Jesus the most were the most religious. At I was just doing a Voxer to a guy that was going through something. I was praying for him. And we were talking about how Jesus never healed the same way and how like yeah. the religious people were so focused on what God had done. They couldn't even see what he was doing. They're like, oh, he's supposed to come as a king, right? Like he's going to take yeah. over, come as a king. He ain't going to die and become the king of kings and all authority of heaven and earth. Like that's not how they saw it. So because of that, they completely missed it. Yeah. And same with like, you know, Jesus and how he moves, man. He speaks fresh to people like, right. They talk about. You have the word, the written word, and then you have the spoken word that he can speak to you individually. And he may be telling you to do something that's different than yeah. what he's said before, never contradicting, obviously, and yeah. consult your pastor if you're listening to me. Maybe get some people around you that can that can really give you direction, but but he can speak to you so individually and yeah. have you do something so unique that may not be exactly what he told everyone else to do. Yeah. May have you pray a different way, worship to a different song. And so I just, I love you hitting on that and being able to speak to people that way. What's been the, the core difference in business? Like I've always known Jesus throughout business. So like the way I've entered it, I was probably more so on the God, like make this happen than me make it happen. When you come from building yeah. business the way you did, and then now co-creating with God, what's been the biggest difference that you've seen or pros and cons to that whole situation brother it's so crazy the timing of this is meant to have we were meant to have this interview today and i'll tell you why man like you know i i've been running a um coaching training program with, for like many years I've, I've always like for like at least the last 10 years been training coaches speakers authors uh and having a lot of fun with it, man, and graduating people through that, raising up leaders and, and, and training coaches how to actually be coaches, how to actually get results. And I'm noticing because, you know, when you're in the marketing space and you're in the world, because I know I'm in the secular world at times, I'm still representation of the kingdom, but it's kind of like this dance of like be the kingdom in the secular and then pull back a bit and kind of recharge because it can be consuming. Um I noticed it's just this constant game, man. It's constant game. And it's, and it's like, you know, like your programs can be hot for like two seasons and the next thing, everyone's looking for the next thing or the next thing. Like what's the next thing up? If, if someone's like, I can support you to get, you know, your first five clients. Now if someone wants to like have a million dollar business with 50 clients, 
in 90 days. You know, it's, there's always like a thing that everyone wants sooner, faster, greater, bigger. And, and so like everyone's trying to pump out more information, more offers, more bold with your guarantees and more. And I'm feeling that at the moment with like the constant level up, even though I know I'm at, I'm a coach by heart. Like I love the art and craft of coaching. I know how to facilitate transformation. I can move the room. I can shift perception. And by the grace of God, like the wisdom that I have around it has been amazing and I can do it and I can teach people how to do it and replicate it with them through the support. Um, but I see it and I'm for, for thinking foresight for the future seeing like how long, how, how long can this game keep being played? And I have a platform that's called all bliss how to be awesome and live a bliss filled life. The word bliss, the definition of bliss means to experience joy in a heavenly state, which I truly believe when we're in alignment with God, we get to experience that. It's not going to be perfect. It's uncomfortable at times, but we get to live in more power and awesomeness in the kingdom. Right? So yeah. I have this platform as a membership platform. And you know, like we, we launched the first run and we've got the next masterclass coming out and, and you may have been here before. Maybe someone's listening. You have a dance between, do I do this here or do that there? Which one do I double down harder on? Which one seems to be, and I, I, um, this last week, I'm like, I've been running hard with the coaching program and I also have all this here waiting for me and I have people in there and I have people asking me about God. And then my whole it comes up is like, yeah, but like a lot of people that are into God don't want to pay more for the higher ticket stuff. I'm just keeping it real with you, man. You know, this is where we're yeah. at. I've been doing this for 14 years, but I'm keeping it real. And, and I've had literally like for the last three days, man, Christian brothers that I'm talking to that are like, yo, man, you're playing small in what you thought was big because what you've got there with that is even bigger. And like, this is not even, they're like, they can see it easily because they're not emotionally tied to it. And, uh, and they're like, cool, that's cool, man. You can keep doing that thing. But I also can see how God is using you as like a vessel. And I've opened myself to that, to be able to go 10 X with this. And again, what it is, is you having obedience in him and, it's tough, man. I can't, I can't lie. Like it's tough sometimes in business when it's like, you know, like I've had times where I felt I put a lot of investment down on something and I've got like building the next thing. We've got to launch and we've got time constraints and I've got staff to pay for. And then like, I'm like, okay, the funds for like being able to spend on the things that are more probably like lifestyle. And then I've got business expenses and then I'm looking at it going, Okay, we got this much. That's cool. And we can work with that. And that'll happen. And we have more coming in. And then next thing you get like a customer that needs a refund because they can't come into the pro. And then like, it feels like things start to go backwards. And so I'm looking at going like, what's going on? And then I have one of my friends, he's going to hospital and needs like money to be, be donated. And then I'm realizing I haven't tithed. And I'm going like, what? And again, I'll go into a cycle and then God's like, just give just give man like wow. he's like trust me and again it's a cycle as you go into that maybe it happens like once every like couple of years for me and i talk with other christian brothers and sis christian sisters where they say they have that experience too and it's like give when you feel like you can't that shows obedience to god and trust and faith and i've been doing that it's like i've been giving at times where i'm like you can always justify and say no nah, i need money for this or that or like you know baby's coming or the house or the whatever you know we need to cut like a newer car what then it's that's like the perfect time to justify it but god's saying that's the perfect time to be obedient to me because it wouldn't have made a difference before now you're paying attention to it so wow. my walk at the moment is is seeing how can i be obedient with god and trusting in him so that he can show me the power that can move through me for his kingdom not even for my will man for his kingdom and so that's my walk right now, bro. And it's crazy because you can step into a new arena like that with God and feel like a little kid again. And I've done it's big so things good, in the dude. personal development space. Man, I don't know if you relate to this or if you've had people that you've ministered for or anyone's listening where they've been in that place. I know I took like it felt like a financial L when I first came back to Christ. I, I, I was making, you know, over six figures, multiple six figures for many years. And then I, I made like a $40,000 a year that year after I got baptized. But I wow. was totally cool with that, bro, because I was just spending all my time with Jesus, man. And yeah. I did like a bit of coaching, but I spent most of my time in isolation just, just with Christ in the Word. And and it's like I look back at that sometimes and think, man, the fire that I had in some of those seasons, I'm like, where's like, let me tap back into some of that. 
but also with the more wisdom. So I'm praying for wisdom, man. I'm praying for guidance. I'm praying for the strength to be obedient. And um, it's not easy, man, but it's worth it because every time I've done that and it's God's shown me like in three to six months or a year as it unfolds you, like, oh, I see how that was even better than what I could ever imagine. It's where yeah, my yeah. biggest growth periods are. And, th and those, those foundational seasons that you just talked about, that time – with God is the platform. It's the, it's kind of like that. What's done in private will be shattered from the rooftops on the positive. Those are some of the seasons that you look back and you, you go, I, I want some of that, but also, wow, I'm so glad I took advantage of that season while it was there because, yeah. you know, you may not be able to take off a year with a new child, right? You're like, oh, let me just take off a year and go pray and for a it. year. And that's right? it. So it's like the lifestyle can change and then you want to start setting other goals. There are always going to be other goals that you can bring in. Yeah. So good. And like, like for me, you know, yeah. like I, I didn't have that was, it was building a business, became a Christian. It was like, I was in ministry and got pushed into business and just flopped for years. And so it was like right. almost the struggle of like, how do you manage the, the disappointment with God of like, I thought you told me to do this and now it's like sucking. Yeah. Yeah. I could have just done ministry and I would have been fine, but don't, but take heart. Look at Joseph. Right? I always look at him now and I'm like, he was like, I'm going to rule over my brothers. They all say, well, we're going to kill you. We'll sell you into slavery and then go to jail. And then the guy that's supposed to get you out of jail doesn't even tell the big guy. And then it's like, and then he, but he never lost heart because he knew the vision. He prospered everywhere he was at. And then he ended up in the right place and knew that it was God the whole time. I'm like, I got to remember that even if I, I'm not feeling, I'm not in jail. I'm not in slavery. So I'm doing pretty good. And God's creating something. But you had said something about giving. This is something that my friend did really well. He always was like setting an example to me of obedience. And there was a time where I wasn't involved with a, a certain church I was looking for one. So I used that as an excuse not to tithe and give and things like that. Yeah. I was like, Oh, well, I just don't know where to go. I'll just give to this person or this organization, but I wasn't really counting. I was like, just trying to wiggle my way around just like my own wrestle with it. But I had interviewed someone that threw out these couple of things that I thought were really cool. He said, tithe 10% of what you make. And the, and the, the promise with that is that he's going to rebuke the devourer on your behalf. Like that's the promise that was attached to it. Also, I love the whole giving thing around like it's the only time that God says, test me in this. People can have beliefs around it, but the promise around it is rebuking the devourer on your behalf. And then the second one was um, uh, the first fruits and and giving your first fruits. And he, this guy had told me, he's like, he's like every new product that he launches, he gives just the first sale he gives away. It's like, oh, it's my first fruit of that new product. And I was like, oh, that's, that's cool. And I've been getting kind of convictions around it with certain things, almost yeah. backtracking it. Like, well, what if I went back in time and gave my first fruits that I kind of held on to, <laughs> you know, getting these, like these wrestles that I'm not perfect with, but I'm like feeling it. Um, and it was just really cool. Just kind of like showing different ways to give. And I thought it was cool that you said that I have a friend of mine that man, he's scaled to a personal income of over 5 million a year. And I saw him consistently continue to tithe throughout the whole time. Yeah. And that becomes, wow. you know, that's a $500,000 tithe, not on top of anything else. And people think yeah. that would be easy if you make that. But man, I just, when you make 100K and you're tithing 10 to K, great. But to see someone continue to do it and faithfully do it, it was inspiring to me because I was like, it kind of gut checked me. It was just like, man, I, I, this is something that I, 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 like you said, I have a desire to be obedient because of the encounter with Jesus, yeah. not I need to do this or else I'm not going to be loved or yeah. accepted yeah. into the kingdom. And I think that's a great, a great uh, point that you also made, man. Well, you know what it is too, man, is that it, well, before I go into this, I want to take, leave a comment on that. Isn't it so funny in the new agey space? Everyone's like, manifest your dreams, manifest your millions of dollars, manifest your boss life, whatever. And and then what happens then is is like it's basically all for whatever you can get for you. Yep. What if they were teaching 
give 10% away for God and cause <laughs> it just won't, it wouldn't work, bro. People wouldn't be as much inspired to do that. Cause they're like, wait, I don't want to give away that. I just want it for myself. And again, it comes back to that selfishness, man. And and this is bro, my man. biggest concern in the self-development space is self, 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 self. It's narcissistic, yeah. bro. It's literally narcissistic. And, and I know you had another thing, but man, I looked at Solomon and people are always, even, even a, a Christian entrepreneur would be like, oh, I, I want to study Solomon because I want the wealth of Solomon, right? Like the, it's like, right. but we missed the whole point when I was really just like going through it. I had never really like really gone through it, right? Like I had maybe read past it to like get to the next thing, but I really went through it. And the whole time his framework was like praising God for what God had done in the past. One, he recognized what God was doing for him. He recognized and humbled himself. I, I'm not like a child. I don't know how to go in or out, right? Like, I'm like a child. And then he focused all on help me get the wisdom, but really the judgment, the knowledge to to be able to lead your people. And it was always about like God's will and God's vision and what, what his purpose was and who he was meant to serve, right? Like the the purpose of the wisdom, the the info wasn't to be rich or like you said with these the new age thing like personal development all about me it's like a lot of times even if it's i want wisdom so i can make money it's like well that wasn't even what solomon ever was concerned about he was concerned about serving the people that god had called him to serve and the the vision and purpose god had put him on the earth for and he knew that he needed his strength to do it and and obviously like god kind of fashion kind of like when abraham was sacrificing isaac it was like after that obedience it was like oh yeah by the way blessing 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 it's hard not to look at those blessings while you're being yeah. obedient and going, re, trying to reconstruct it even myself right i'm like i want to shoot i want to build the business and have the wisdom but like at the end of the day yeah. how can i focus on who god's called me to serve outside of myself like you're saying how can mm. i get in line with his purpose and yeah. even on a personal note bro like my wife and i've been trying to get pregnant again and it's been like a process. And when I started thinking, how can I raise up a kid to carry out the will of God on earth? I started having this peace on, man, God's going to bless me with a child so I can raise him up to carry out a God-given vision on the earth. And it became less about, God, will you give me another kid? It became more yeah. about, how, how can I align with the will of God on earth? Yeah. And, it, and again, it, that difference between... I want, can you give me, I want to be happy and successful to like, what is God doing? How can I be a part of it? So yeah. that spoke to me. Yeah, that yeah, was good. Yeah. yeah, that's deep, man. That's really deep. Yeah, look, God wants us to be able to teach our children about the gospel um, so that it can continue on and be the representative of the kingdom. Where we, we're, He's always going to need his people here, man. You know, if no one did that, there'd be nothing but darkness in the world. Right. And we're back to the days of Noah. <laughs> oh gosh. Uh, yeah. So I, the other thing I was going to say, man, is, well, there's a couple of things like the wisdom is what King Solomon was asking for. Right. He didn't even say wealth. It was, it was like, I want wisdom. And God saw like, wow, his intention is that because he wants to lead people like God needed someone to lead the nation of Israel. And it goes back to us too. Like we, it, it didn't stop at him. It's like, if we ask God for that wisdom and we can follow through with what he's commanding us, it shows that we, he can trust us as well. And our obedience to him is a, it's like a re reciprocity type of process. Uh, and then more will be given unto you. Right. Um, I think Joseph is a great example of, of that too, in his own way. But what's cool about Joseph is, do you ever know, do you know what types and anti-types are? What's a definition? So it's like similarities too. They're like reflections okay. in the scriptures from the old Testament to the new and, and some, you know, verses, uh, characters from one to the other and things that happen in one can parallel the other. Um, Daniel was a type and a type to revelation. So it actually correlates and parallels. Cool. If you understand Daniel, you understand revelation deeper because of the prophecies that align. Right. Cool. Um, but Joseph was actually an anti-type, a reflection of Christ. It helped us to understand Jesus in a way because both were betrayed by someone close to them, right? He was, you know, Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. Jesus was betrayed by one of his disciples, Judas. Both were falsely yeah. accused and punished, both of them. 
um, both had a special relationship with their father, right? Both were able to interpret dreams where they were able to, you know, Jesus spoke in parables and was able to pass on that message as, as God in the flesh, right? Joseph had his dreams and both saved their people from destruction, which is Christ coming to save us and what he does. So pretty cool stuff, man. Like it's, it's really cool how God works through people in this world and it doesn't stop there again, that, that doesn't stop there. Like we got to remember that, you know, we, if we're wanting to be that vessel with God, we get to do incredible things in this world as well, which surpasses like your everyday business and your everyday getting a Forbes or Inc publication for Like who cares? You know what I mean? Compared to what we can do in the kingdom. It's pretty cool what he's uh, offering us. Well, dude, you talked about some of your new platforms. We were like, yo, let's bust out this episode. And we're like, we've made it to where you got saved. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's about as far as we've got. And we're like cruising, man. So, and I couldn't imagine if it was in person, like in you know, Zoom interviews, it, it probably feel about twice as long because we're not chilling right next to each other. You got lag and internet and all this stuff. So the fact that yeah, we've been yeah, able yeah. to just cruise this far through not zoom obviously but a recording platform um which until they sponsor the show i'm not mentioning just kidding riverside uh, <laughs> so but it's been so cool man i would love to know the this platform you have the podcast that you talked about you you have this new platform that you're talking about as well please let the people know what those things are so they get more connected for sure, for sure yeah. man yeah so the unknown god um it's a podcast about God for people that don't like church. We've got maybe like 40 something episodes. We talk about some pretty gnarly things on there, like UFOs and aliens, like death, hell and the grave. We go into, uh, uh, you know, like uh, the, the demonic things that happen in the uh, music industry. And then like, what can we ma make? Can we make sense of it? Like, is this something to be concerned with the games of Satan and also uh, the incredible uh, offerings of Christ. Like, so we have a lot of like pretty controversial topics. Oh. I think the most powerful for anybody to really deepen their understanding of what the scriptures means is, you know, revelation can be a little bit of a, like a Rubik's cube sometimes for people. So, uh, we did a whole series on Daniel and we also did a whole series on revelation. So if you can like listen to Daniel and revelation, you're going to know most more than 99% of Christians out there. I'm not even joking. Like, <laughs> because you understand the parallels, how they tie together because it's almost like one book. When you can look at Daniel tied with revelation, it shows the whole prophecies unfold by um, the nature of how empire is from the Babylonian times to the empire of the B system today, man, it's, it's the full picture. It's nuts. So yeah, definitely listen to that. Um, Matthew McConaughey is on there. We got him on. We got, um, he talked about God, how God is not your babysitter, which was a really cool conversation we had. Uh, we have Lecrae, who's a, a, a hip hop Christian artist. Yeah. It was cool. We, we went pretty personal without it talking about like abortions and decisions that he made in the past and like how he, he handles hate and the things that he's learned from scripture, which is really cool. Um, a guy called Abdu Murray, he wrote a book which just came out called is Christianity, a white man's religion. And, uh, he was a Muslim, a lawyer. He tried to prove someone wrong and investigated the hell out of Christianity he ended up coming to Christ, which is really cool. So he shares some awesome, he's an apologetics, uh, preacher and minister at the moment. So like he, he's awesome. Ivor Myers is another guy who breaks down, um, incredible pastor he used to be a hip hop artist, um, back in the day signed under a label, millions of plays. Like he came to Christ, uh, he breaks down scripture like he's so good creatively and he can see things in scripture that most people don't even piece together. He, he makes sense of a lot of awesome things and breaks things down in, in analogy. So listen to him. Um, and then I have All Bliss, A-W-E-B-L-I-S-S dot com, All Bliss. Uh, check it out. It's uh, We've got like 46 workshops. I've got um, I got Christian entrepreneur as I got, you know, faith filled, uh, speakers, coaches, and authors in there as well, teaching incredible workshops. And then I have weekly mentorship calls in there too. So if anybody wants to jump in, it's like 47 bucks a month. It's, you know, cheaper than a coffee a day, jump in and let's yeah. jam, you know, it's all about bringing people back to God's original design. And, uh, yeah, it's cool. We have like prayer, prayer calls on there, uh, faith-based meditations coming through, uh, very shortly. We've got the apps and everything are out for it as well. So yeah, man. Exciting times. That's awesome. 
Thanks exactly. for having me on too, bro. I, I appreciate you like sharing your platform for me to be able to also, you know, share what we've been up to and would love yeah. for you to be on there too. I think it'd be awesome, man. Yeah, dude, I would absolutely love to. And you talked about the platform being less than a coffee a day. Coffee here is four seventy eight for a cappuccino. So that would get me about 10 days in of having a coffee a day. So <laughs> I'm like, I'm, oh, I'm like, I'm oh, Australia, I like man. you know, we sometimes have like $8 coffees, $10 coffees is nuts, man. Yeah. So you're like, just don't have coffee four times a month and <laughs> that'll cover your entire thing. Uh, I, I just think that there's not that. I think one important part to it is that where your money is, your heart is also like, like where your treasure is. And, and for a lot of people, treasure is like the reason why it's tough to invest 47 bucks for something for someone especially in something that's good, right? They'll invest it in a phone bill because they're like, yeah. oh, well, that's normal. But like something for themselves, it's like there's a tie to it. I think there's something more important than just like, you know, paying for a platform. It costs money to bring people in and for people to work on projects and to manage people. But on top of that, for the person giving it, there's something so important about if you want to grow in this area, invest in the area. Even if you have a cause that you care about, if you want to be more connected to a cause, invest in it. And you can invest through your skill sets and your time, but also your money. And like the money's actually yeah. the one that takes the least amount of anything. Like yeah. you should be happy that Joel's not like, Hey man, like come and volunteer 10 hours a week and we'll give you the platform. It's like, <laughs> no, just, yeah. just skip out four coffees. So I, I think there's something really, really big to be said on that. And, and we'd love to be a part of it, but thank you, man, for, for being on God's business. It's been awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Appreciate you, man. Stay blessed.